சொல்லிவிட்டால் What's up kids, David here, Solar X State, and uh, lo and behold, uh, we find ourselves uh, in the mix, do we not, no doubt, find ourselves in the mix. So you know, oftentimes, in the discussion around God, uh, one often hears uh, the accusation, if you will, people be like, you know man, where is your proof? You know, this fairy tale God of yours, you know, this, this, uh, this God, this urban myth, if you will, this rural, this rural myth, you know, uh, because clearly it's the rural folk that haven't been to college, uh, and if they had, they would realize that there's no proof of God. Well, I would like to ask this, um, what... <clears throat> What, pray tell, constitutes proof? How much proof would one need uh, that the balances might tip in the other direction? That one might realize uh, that maybe, that maybe there is a God. That maybe that the universe is the product of craft and not of blind purposelessness. That maybe that the cosmos is the result of purposeful intention. Just like every other complex thing is no doubt born of purpose because entropy a law in nature states that all things break down over time that systems break down over time so we see not in nature the evidence of simple things becoming more complex. Rather, we see the evidence of complex things breaking down over time. Systems running their course, unwinding, spinning down, becoming more rudimentary, not more dynamic. <clears throat> and so it may, it may be that nature is the result of craft, not of directionless accident. But that being said, you know, back to my original question, you know, how much evidence does one need? You know, I'm not saying that to belittle the notion um, of evidentiary experience. I'm not trying to dismiss the notion of objective facts that can be weighed in the balances. But I am, I am asking the question, with objective facts in hand, how much evidence does one need in order to change one's world view. The Bible suggests that the problem is in our hearts. That to the, to the extent that facts are available, is it not the case that the human condition will evade the facts as they are, that we will turn away from a truth and prefer the accommodations of our own heart. That we will prefer what is subjectively convenient 
to our own emotional state rather than be it the mountain of evidence that may pile up in front of our very eyes. <clears throat> and you see this. You see this in the scientific community when they talk about um, the possibility that there may be uh, the hand of God at play in the things that are seen, in the parameters that are measured, in the attributes that are conceptualized, in the language of scientific inquiry. You will hear from the scientific community that anything but God, anything but God, because somehow concluding, coming to the conclusion that maybe an intelligent designer is the best explanation, that that somehow is unacceptable. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why is it unacceptable to find out that there is a designated driver? Why is it unacceptable to find out that there is someone helming this ship, that we are not just adrift? Why is that unacceptable? Is it because the data, the science, the facts scream that it is unacceptable? Or is it because the condition of our heart allows it not? That we just can't accept because we don't want it to be true. Because we don't want it to be true. You know, even Jesus himself said, if, if one were to rise from the dead, they still would not believe. That seems like some pretty solid evidence. And I'm not saying that <clears throat> that based on some quote from the Bible that you should just buy hook, line, and sinker. But Jesus is, is pointing out a condition of men's heart that though the evidence were piled at their feet, that they would prefer their subjective, convenient comfort zone over the reality. In uh, Isaiah chapter 39, starting in verse 21. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and, inha and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. That God spreads forth the heavens as a tent to dwell in. That bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Our judges those that discriminate, those that discern for us the good of the law as we see it, God sees as vanity. Our judgments, those who sit on our courts, are but vanity to God. Yea, they shall not be planted, they shall not be sown. Their stock shall not take root in the earth, and he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or who shall be my equal? says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by name, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power and faileth 
not. It's so interesting here in verse 22, it says, He stretches out the heavens as a curtain. You know, think about what a curtain is. A curtain is something that you hang over a window, you know, to, to sort of block the light, to give you privacy. There's an inside and then there's an outside. Well, the idea that the heavens are but a curtain between us and the kingdom of God, does it not imply that there is some greater reality? Just like there is a greater reality be between the inside of your home and the outside of your home. The inside of your home, while you're in it, may seem to be your world until you walk out the front door and see the world that is at your footstep. And this in closing, I will ask of you at the end of this video, what world is at your footstep? at your doorstep. Should the facts be made known? Should the evidence pile up at your feet? What world is at your very doorstep? And that, man, is a freaking vid. Take care, God bless.